Praise the Lord. We we'll rise up and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer in preparation for the Bible study tonight. You want to open your mouth and you want to talk to the Lord, and the Lord will prepare your heart to receive the word of God. That the Lord Himself will reveal Himself to you, like He revealed Himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar knew that this God is the most high God. Except the Lord opens our eyes, we'll not be able to see the reality of the truth. And a great revelation that the Lord is bringing to the hearts of his own people. That's why you want to pray in all sincerity. You want to pray with faith that God himself, in his goodness, in his wisdom, will reveal himself to you and make you see how great our God is, how mighty, how glorious our God is. That the Lord will give you the heart of a worshiper to worship the sp in spirit and to worship in truth. And that your study of the word will be profitable, beneficial unto you. Pray that the Lord, through the revelation of his word, will dispel all darkness, drive away all doubts and clouds, that the truth of divine revelation will make clear, made plain to your heart, and the knowledge will bring conviction Confidence, power, more trust, faith in the Almighty God. That the same knowledge that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had of the true and the living God that made them to be able to stand in the hour of trial, in the hour of temptation and difficulty that God will grant you that same revelation so you'll be able to stand in these trying hours of the world pray that God will use you and use your testimony to bring conviction, great, strong, unshakable conviction to the hearts of other people that will see what great things the Lord is doing in your life and through your life. That through your life, the impact and the influence of your life, others will have the desire to follow after this true God. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood, Faithful, loyal, committed, and true to the very end. This same God, in all his power and wisdom, will help you to stand faithful, loyal, and true. Every moment of your life, till the very end. 
while others are compromising and falling. That you, by his grace, in the strength and the might and the power of the Spirit, that you will stand, stand firm, not in the arms of the flesh, but in the armor of God. That your strength will not have any weakness. Your knowledge of the Lord will make you so strong. You'll be able to stand firm in the day of battle. Let the prayer prepare your heart. Get you ready for the revelation of God to his own. The wise take a decision that will get the very best from the word of the Lord. The strength and might will be yours. That the great God of heaven will so make himself clear and plain that when that hour of trial, temptation, trouble comes, nothing will make you yield or fall. To the wishes and the desires of the enemy. The entrance of his word giveth light. Let that light shine in your heart. And shine through you to the lives of all the people around you. Time of study is a time of strength, spiritual strength. Unconquerable strength. I pray that this study will make you strong in the Lord. Give you spiritual backbone. Strengthened with spiritual might in the inner man.
pray that you'll never be the same again. After studying this word and the people around you that see you and it draws stress from the stress of your life will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we do thank you and we bless your name. One that you have kept us alive. And two that you give us the interest and the desire to know you more. And you brought us here tonight. And all those brothers and sisters in all the various locations in this country and beyond, in the whole of the continent of Africa and beyond, you brought us together to study your word. Oh Lord, we pray there will be strength and power, dynamic, spiritual energy infused, injected into everyone studying tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, oh Lord, that your power will keep us strong and firm. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You drive weakness and timidity and coward, and cowardliness away from us in Jesus name. Lord, we pray the might of your spirit and the power of your spirit coming in the light and with the revelation of your word, you give us tonight in Jesus name. As we take the spiritual food, make us strong. As we see this light of the scripture, help us to see the path we ought to walk through in Jesus' name. And Lord, when that hour of testing, trial will come, oh Lord, we pray like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be able to stand our ground in Jesus' name. We'll not turn back for the enemy. We'll not look back to the land of perdition. We're moving on and marching forward in the strength of the Lord. And nothing will stop our onward journey in Jesus' name. Strengthen us in the world tonight. Enlighten us with the revelation tonight. That Lord, with you, will be able to declare the might and the glory and the majesty of the Most High God. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We're coming to Daniel chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 3, we're looking at the revelation and the recognition of the true God. If you remember what we studied last, you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar challenged Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because these three faithful, loyal, uncompromising children of God, they refused to worship his idol. And then he became so furious, so angry, and he then said something. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, verse 15. Now, if ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornage, flute, harp, sackbot, satry, dulcima, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, now you ask this question, but if ye will not worship, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning furry furnace. And who is that God? And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? That was the time the battle line was drawn. He challenged the Almighty God because he didn't know God. He only knew his own idols and his own gods 
And he was surprised that some people could have the audacity and the boldness, the effrontery. To refuse to worship his idols. That's why he asked a question in verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? That made him angry that he could ever stand true to their own gods. And then stand firm in the recognition of the power and the majesty and the highness and the greatness of their God. And he said, can it be true? Am I hearing myself right? That you will not worship my gods and you will not worship and bow down and bend to the image which I have set up. Then he said, I'm going to give you another chance. If you now, when you hear that Babylonian music, worldly music, if you will fall down, worship, that will be all right. I'll for forgive the past and overlook your foolishness of the past. But if you remain firm, adamant, and rigid, uncompromising, that you are not going to worship my God, I'm asking you now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, think about this very well, because that's the furnace of fire right there. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? I thank God for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I say thank God for those three faithful people. They said, we are not careful to answer you, king, in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is your sub the Lord. I said, you sub the Lord. And when that hour of trial, temptation, pressure, persecution, when it comes, the Lord will see you through. And so they said, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the born in furry furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. I'm telling you that that did not convince Nebuchadnezzar at all. That made him more angry. That's the reason why he told them to heat the furnace seven times hotter. And then they threw them in. The people that threw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what happened to them? They were burnt up by the flame of the fire that came. Look at verse 21. Then those men were bound in their coats, their hosing, and their hearts, and their other garments. And were cast into the midst of the burning furry furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment, verse 22, was urgent. And the furnace exceeding hot. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But then, these three, the faithful ones. These three, the uncompromising believers. These three, the righteous followers of God. These three, the people that refused to worship idols and they gave their allegiance and commitments and absolute surrender unto the true and living God in heaven. These three, here is what we are told about them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 23. They fell down bound into the midst of the bony furry furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste. And spake and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True king, he said, He answered and said, Lo, behold, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no heart, and the form of the fourth is like who? The son of God. That's what brought the confession that he made eventually. In the latter part of verse 29, there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. There is no other God that can deliver after this sort. The events of this great chapter in Daniel end with the revelation of God. The beginning was bitter. The end was better. It's always like that. When you are trusting the Lord, it might appear that the beginning is sour, but the end is sweet. It might appear that the beginning is very dangerous, but the end is delightful, delightsome. 
As you look at the beginning, you'll see these three Hebrew children, they were going to suffer. They were going to die because of their faith. But they didn't die. They lived. You will not die. You will live. And even though it was bitter at the beginning, you'll see at the very end, everything turned around. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, there is no God that can deliver. After they sought like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar was a great man, a mighty man, a powerful man, a worldly wise man. But he did not know the true God. Doesn't that confirm what the scripture says? That the world, by wisdom, knew not God. And then Job tells us in chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, can thou find, can thou by searching find out God, can thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What can thou do? Without a divine revelation of God, it is impossible to know the Lord. In fact, Job said, I go forward, but he's not there. I'm backward, and I cannot perceive him. On, on the left hand, where he does work, I cannot behold him. He hideth himself. On the right hand, that I cannot see him. Then he said, oh, that I knew where I might find him. That's how Nebuchadnezzar was groping in the dark. He didn't know God. He couldn't find God until he threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furry furnace. And then the force, like the Son of God, came and was walking with them, fellowshipping with them. Man gropes in darkness, trying to find God. Without the revelation of himself, we cannot enter into the noble life of a glorious purpose that makes us worthy of a divine birthright. That is, we cannot know God and then have the experience and the touch and the transformation of knowing God until he reveals himself unto us. Most men, including the wise and the mighty, have made unto themselves God. After the similitude of a man, an idol is a man-made God. How vain is the quest. How vain is the passion of unaided man in trying to know and to find God. The result as a whole is a lamentable failure, a melancholy failure. Nebuchadnezzar in his ignorance asked, And who is that God only after divine revelation? Would he say, blessed be the God of Shadrach, of Meshach, and of Abednego. The path of reasoning through human senses does not lead to the discovery or the knowledge of the true God. As you reason, as you try to calculate, as you try to go through logic by yourself, you will not be able to find out God. God to the ultimate, the way you should know God. Only the highway cast off by the king himself leads to that knowledge. That highway is called revelation. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 1 verse 18, he said, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And then he said in Matthew, he said, Neither knoweth any man the Father, the God in heaven, the God of heaven, save except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. With the revelation received through him, whose form is like the Son of God, Nebuchadnezzar had no more doubt about God. He knew that now God exist. He was first of all saying, who is that God? But then when he saw Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and then he saw the fourth, like the son of God walking with them in the fire. He said, now I know that there is God. Look at verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the bony furry furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, ye servants of who? Of the most high God come forth and come hither. Now he knew about God. And he called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the servants of the most high God. And then he tells us in verse 29, Therefore I make a decree that every people, 
nation, and language, which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be caught in pieces, and their houses shall be shall be made a donkey, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. What has he discovered? Number one, he has discovered the existence of God. Number two, he has discovered the greatness of God. Number three, he has discovered the power of God. Number four, he has known now the majesty of God. Number five, he has now detected and found out the dominion of God. Number six, he has found out the exaltation of God. And number seven, the uniqueness of God. No other God like this God. This is unique. This is high. It's the most high. It's the greatest of all gods. There is no comparison, no rival, no parallel with this God. How did he find out? How did he know that this God indeed actually exists? And has greatness and power and majesty and dominion. And that this God is exalted above all, no rival, very unique indeed. The revelation was irresistible. And the logic was indisputable. But how did he get to that? How did he finally get to the fact that this God is great, holy, high, and majestic? Number one, by the pres preservation of the true worshippers in the fire. He had seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as the worship God. And by the very preservation of those people in the fire, he knew there must be God. Number two, by the triumph of faith over the fire. He saw how triumphant their faith was. And it wasn't a faith in a dead God, in a dead idol, in a metal God. It was a faith in the God of heaven. Number three, what convinced him was the appearance of the Son of God. They threw three into the fire. And now we have the fourth person like the appearance of the Son of God. He knew there must be God in heaven that sent his son to fellowship with these three people. That's how he knew there is God. Number four is by the silent communication of incarnation. When we say incarnation, that means Jesus Christ becoming like man and coming to this world. And there was a silent communication of the incarnation of Christ right there. And then he knew this must be the Son of God. And if the Son of God is there, God is there above. And then number five is by heaven's prompt response to us challenging events. Something was taking place here on earth. And he had mentioned God. And he has said, who is that God? And as far as the earth is from heaven, the God of heaven had heard the challenge and responded promptly to that challenge. That's why he said, now I know there is God. Number six, by the verification of unprecedented miracle. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, they examined them, they verified. And they look at their clothes, they look at their hair, they look at every part of them, and nothing was taught by the fire. And he said, now I know, now I know, there is God of heaven, there is no God like him. Number seven, by the unargued conviction of the still small voice something was telling him in his heart with everything you see with everything you behold and with the evidence before you can you doubt now of the existence and the glory and the power and the majesty of God he said there is no doubt anymore the truth of the revelation of the eternal omnipotent God was turned on the heart of the king and of all his princes that's why he came to declare that there is this great God. There are three things we learn here. We learn, number one, the impotent gods of the heathen. Because he himself confessed, there is no other God like this. And then those people that picked up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them into the fire, those people all died. Their gods could not protect them or preserve them. That makes us to learn like Nebuchadnezzar lied that day, the impotent 
gods of the heathen. Number two, the incomparable God in heaven. That this God has no rival, has no comparison, has no parallel. There is none like him, the incomparable God in heaven. And then number three, the infinite greatness of the Most High. That's what we're looking at today in the study. Number one, the impotent gods of the heathen. Number two, the incomparable God in heaven. And then number three, the infinite greatness of the Most High. Let's look at number one. Number one, the impotent gods of the heathen. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 14. Daniel 3, verse 14. And let us see what he mentioned and what he said about his gods in the plural. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do ye not worship my gods, my gods, and not worship the golden image which I have set up? Here, he referred to his gods, but how mighty, how powerful, how significant are those gods? They were nothing. Because they couldn't deliver the people from the fire. The gods of Nebuchadnezzar were of his own making. But our God is our maker. What a difference. Man is powerless. And the God he makes and worships is impotent, powerless and worthless. Man is vain. And his idol God is vanity. Indeed, those idols are lighter and less than vanity. The most mighty men that were in his army who bound Shadrach, Peshach, and Abednego and threw them into the furnace of fire were burnt to death by the flame of the fire of the furnace. The gods of Babylon could not deliver the idol worshippers. The gods of the heathen cannot save. The gods of the heathen cannot deliver from earthly torment or eternal torment. The worldly dignity of all idolaters will be consumed in the flame of divine wrath and there will be none to rescue or deliver them from God's judgment. In fact, idolatry is foolish. God will convince all both now and eternity of the folly of worshipping gods, the gods that cannot save, the gods can, that cannot help, the gods that cannot deliver. Idolatry is an abomination to the almighty God, and the idols and their worshippers shall be destroyed from the earth. The great creator will not accommodate or tolerate such abomination against his honor, against his majesty, and against his glory. Look at verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Where are their gods? They were not there to deliver. But in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God of heaven was there to deliver them in the hour of trial. Let's see what the Bible says about the gods of the heathen, the gods of the pagans, the gods of the people that do not know the true God. In Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah chapter 45, we're reading from verse 20. Isaiah 45, verse 20, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray to a God that cannot save. A God that cannot do what? That cannot save. They don't have any knowledge. They don't have any understanding. They don't have any wisdom. They do not have any revelation. The people that pray to a God that cannot save, that's the God of the heathen, the God that is impotent, the God that is powerless, and a God that cannot save, that cannot help, that cannot deliver. In Jeremiah chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you. O house of Israel, here is a word that the Lord Almighty God himself is declaring to you and to me. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. 
for the heathen are dismayed at them. What that is saying is the heathen people, they want to know the future. And they look at the heavens, they look at the stars, and they're watching the horoscopes. But the Lord is saying, don't you do that. It's worthless. It's confusing. Because the gods of the heathen that they're appealing to through those horoscopes, they deceive. And it is not real. It says in verse 3, for the custom of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workman with the axe, they deck each with silver and with gold. They fasten each with the nails and the hammers that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, be carried, be lifted up, because they cannot go by themselves. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. It's talking about the idols of the idol worshippers. Cannot do good and cannot do evil, but we have a God in heaven who is always doing good. And that God of heaven will do good to your soul and even to your life in Jesus' name. It says, abandon the worthless idols of the people and then submit yourself unto the God of heaven. In Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 11, thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Is telling us that those idols, they've not done anything good. They have not created the universe. They have not created the earth or the heavens. Why are you paying any attention to them? Pay attention to God. He is the God of heaven. And is above all gods. In Psalm 115. Psalm 115. I'm reading from verse 3. It again describes for us the impotent, worthless, useless idols of the world. Gods of the world. It says in Psalm 115 verse 3. But a God is in the heavens. Where is your God? In the sea? On the land? In the forest? In the shrine? No, it says, but our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. They have, no, they have mouths, but, cannot, they, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but cannot see. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but... They handle not, feet have they, but they walk not, neither speak they through their throats. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusted in them. And that's the kind of God that Nebuchadnezzar trusted. The gods of Nebuchadnezzar and the idols of all the heathen people on earth are works of man's hand. That's what we're told in verse 4. They, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. In as much as the maker is always greater than the thing that he has made, these idols are less than the artificers, that is, the people that fashion them. It is evident that such a man-made God, a man-made idol, is no God. Can there be any more? Uh, can there be any more absurdity than that? That somebody is asking for assistance from them, from the people, from the idols that have no strength, that have no power. It says uh, these people they don't have any portion of divinity in them, any portion of divine power in them, and the idols they make cannot have any portion of divinity of divine power in them. All idols and all gods, whether they are silver or gold, whether they are wood or stone, whether they riches or pleasure, all those gods and idols are impotent. Am I right? They are worthless. Is that right? In the hour of need, they have no eyes to pity. They have no ears to hear. They have no tongue to counsel. They have no hand to help. An idol, a God that has eyes but cannot see, is blind, is a blind deity. 
He must be very blind indeed who worships a blind God. We pity a blind man, but how strange it is to worship a blind image. Nebuchadnezzar's image could not tell who its worshippers were and could not protect its worshippers nor punish those who refuse to worship. That's what we are told here, that all these idols are nothing. We are not going to worship any idol. We are going to remain with the true and the faithful and the almighty God who is able to deliver. Let me show you an encounter with one of these idols of the land. In First Samuel chapter 5. First Samuel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. First Samuel chapter 5. Reading from verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer, from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now that Dagon was their god. It was their idol. I'm going to read verse 4, but I'm going to read verse 7. So you will see that the Dagon they're referring to was their god, not my god. I said not my god. My own god is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is in heaven, and he does great and marvelous things. But in their own case, the Philistines, their idol, their God was Dagon. Look at verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. That was their God. Dagon, that was their God. But let's see the encounter here in verse 3 now. And when day of Ashdod arose early in the, early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. The gods of this world will fall before the Lord. They will be destroyed. Their power will not stand and will not hold in Jesus' name. And he took Dagon, they had to carry him, he didn't have any power of his own. And he took Dagon and set him in his place again. Verse 4, and when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon, both the palms of his hand, were caught up upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Just the presence of the ark of God in that place that they are taking from the uh, offline and Phineas, the sons of Eli. Just the presence of that ark destroyed and broke in pieces that Dagon. Doesn't that show you how mighty our God is? If the ark, not even God himself, the ark of God, a representation of God, if that will make the Dagon to fall down and the head off and the hands off and everything up, only the storm remaining, our God must be mighty and powerful. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house thread, thread on the, on the, thread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod. And then it says, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is so upon us and upon Dagon our God. Our God in heaven is so great and mighty. And no power can withstand him. That's why the Lord is challenging us. Come away from any trust, any confidence in the idols of the land. And trust in the God of heaven. And it will be well with you in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. Verse 12. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go. And cry unto the gods, small g, the idols, unto whom they have offered incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. That's the calamity of the people that trust in idols. 
in the time of trouble, in the time of tribulation, in the time of suffering, in the time of affliction. When they cry unto those gods and those idols, they will not be able to deliver them. It says in verse 13, For according to the number of the cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful sin, even the altars to burn incense or to Baal. Therefore pray not thou for these people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. God was saying, let them cry to their gods. They have been worshipping idols. When they get into trouble, I will not hear them. And I'm not going to answer any prayer on their behalf. I want them to prove the impotency of their gods and the insufficiency of their gods and the worthlessness of their gods. What are we to do then? We're to abandon those idols and we're to make sure that we put our heart, our life on the Lord God alone and our God will deliver us. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. We're reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 19. We're looking at verse 18 as well as verse 19. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And then it says in verse 19, And many of them also, which used curious as, brought their books together. And they counted the, uh, brought their books together and burnt them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. What that is saying is that those who are worshipping idols before. And now they came to know the Lord. All their books, all their clothes, all their regalia, all the things they used in worshipping the idols, and all the idols themselves, they brought everything together and they bunched them so that they can rely on the God of heaven alone. Because God is able to bear your body. He's able to remove your mountain. It's able to carry your load. It's able to solve all the problems of your life. We don't need any of those idols, any of those gods. Burn them, get rid of them, dispose of them. We can depend on God and God will see us through. I say God will see us through. His power will not fail. His promises will not fail. His promises are yes and amen in Christ. Those idols mean nothing. Those idols can do nothing. But our God, the God of heaven, He is the one that is able to deliver. He will deliver us in Jesus' name. And if you have anybody around you still bowing down to idol and still worshipping idol, why don't you show them the light of the watch of God and the revelation that those idols, they mean nothing. Those idols will amount to nothing. That we are standing in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord. And as we stand with the Lord, the promises of God will work mightily in our lives in Jesus' name. And now, but you must serve God and serve Him alone. Not God and an idol, not God and another thing. God and God alone must be your confidence. And if God and God alone is your confidence, then He will see you through in every challenge of life in Jesus' name. I come to point number two, the incomparable God in heaven. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, verse 29. Daniel chapter 3. We're looking at verse 29. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be caught in pieces, and their houses shall be made a don't heal because, because there is no other God. Everybody, can you say that with me? There is no other God. That can deliver after this sort. That shows us how incomparable our God is to any God in this world. Any God of the earth. It tells us in the word of God that this God, there's nobody, there's no other God like him. I want you to look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We're looking at verses 5 through 9. Psalm 89. And we're looking at it from verse 5. 
And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who is in heaven, who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? And that's what eventually Nebuchadnezzar confessed himself said, There is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Why did he say that? How did he come to that? How did he get such a revelation? A notable miracle of deliverance had been wrought by the God of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar and his princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors examined Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. What did they see? They saw that these men upon uh, these men were men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was any ear of their head seen, neither were their coats changed, and neither the smell of fire had passed upon them. Because of that, they could not deny that miracle. So Nebuchadnezzar, he spoke and he said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered the servants that trusted in him. If you trust the Lord, that's how he's going to deliver you. If you have confidence in the Lord, that is how the Lord is going to deliver you. And if you put your confidence in God, your faith in God, and you say, I have no other God but the God of heaven. I bow to no other God but the God of heaven. I worship no other God but the God of heaven. I submit, surrender to no other God but the God of heaven. That is how God, as you put your confidence on your faith, your trust in Him, that's how He will deliver you. And then the kings of this world and the princes of this world will be able to testify on your behalf that there is no other God that can deliver after they sought. They confess and the people who see you know you too. They'll confess that same thing in Jesus' name. No one in heaven, no one on earth can be compared with the almighty God. No one can rival him. Neither among the greatest kings on earth, nor among the highest angels in heaven. As we are talking about this true God, he is incomparable in every way. He is incomparable in his being, incomparable in his existence. Number one, in his attributes and perfections. There is none like God. Look at all the attributes of God, all the characteristics of God, all the, all the natural things that we see about God. There is nobody to be compared with him. Number two, in his holiness and power, this God is holy. This God is mighty and this God is powerful. Number three, in his knowledge and wisdom. Who will have the same knowledge as the almighty God has? Or the same wisdom as the Almighty God has. Number four, in His love and in His goodness. See His love for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And see His goodness over Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Which God has ever done something like that before? And then number five, in His truth and justice. is truthful. And is faithful. is a great covenant keeper. The God of heaven. Number six. In his providence and redemption. Number seven. In his glory and majesty. As you look at this God. And you study about him. And then you see the actions of this God. The manifestation of his glory and majesty. You will see that there is no comparison with this God at all. Our God has no equals among the gods of the Chaldeans. He has no equal, no rival among the gods of the Canaanites. He has no equal, no rival, no parallel among the gods of the nations. He has no rival. God's excellence and supremacy is so high as the heavens are above the earth. None of the gods of the nations are capable of doing that for their worshippers, which the God of heaven has done for his own. The gods of the heathen were but lately invented and will shortly perish. The gods of the heathen, were they not created, were they not made, were they not fashioned by men who just came up yesterday? Those gods were lately created and they were lately made and then they are going to shortly perish, get out of sight. But the eternal God is of boundless eternity and shall abide forever and ever. There is none like our God. 
I said there is none like our God. It's without parallel, without tribal. This God like no other in the whole universe is eternal. It's unchangeable. It's omnipotent. It's omniscient. And is omnipresent. Let's look at Psalm 89 now. Psalm 89. I'm reading from verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. In verse 6, for who in the heaven it can be can be compared unto the Lord, who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be added in reverence of all them that are around about that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is strong, who is a strong Lord, like unto thee, or to the to thy faithfulness round about thee, thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. You will see here that the psalmist had known about the majesty of God, about the glory of God, about the power of God, about the exalted place, exalted position of this almighty God. And he gives voice to that, that the rest of us reading, learning, will also know that this God has no comparison. In fact, there's a song that the children of Israel sang when they came out of the Red Sea because they saw the marvelous wonders of the Lord. We're looking at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, in verse 9, all through to verse 11. Exodus 15, verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My loss shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. That's how the enemy bragged. That's what the enemy thought they were going to do when they were pursuing the children of Israel. But then God was on their side. And God is on our side. And when God is on your side, the enemies are going to be put to shame. And the idols of the world, of the people of the world, they are going to be brought to nothing. And that's exactly what God did for the children of Israel. Because they trusted in God. They had faith in God. And they put their allegiance and worship unto the Almighty God alone. In verse 10 it says, Thou didst blow with thy wind. And the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Now verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? No comparison. No parallel. No rival. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Among the gods. Who is like thee? Glorious in holiness. Fearful in praises. Doing wonders. I pray that those wonders of the Lord will be realized in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy Chapter 33, every part of the Bible uh, agreeing to the fact that there is no comparison with the Almighty God. He is the incomparable God. He lives in heaven and then he manifests his power here on earth. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, anytime you get into trouble, remember how great or big our God is. Anytime you have a challenge, remember how great or big our God is. Anytime the people of the world, the idol worshippers, worshipping the gods of the heathen. Anytime they challenge you, remember you are not like them. Our God is not like their God. Our rock is not like their rock. We depend on the almighty eternal God. And that almighty eternal God, he is our refuge and is going to keep us safe and sound. And is going to keep us protected all our lives in Jesus' name. In the day, in the night, there is nothing to fear. Because we serve a God that has no comparison to all the gods of this world. Deuteronomy chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in the hell, and in this excellency on the sky. The eternal God is the refuge. I thought you would say, Amen. Amen. What's a refuge? A refuge is shelter. A refuge is a place you enter in, and then the enemy chasing you, they will not find you. Satan running after you will not be able to touch you. 
In fact, you get into that refuge, it says, the righteous, the name of the Lord is a mighty tower, and the righteous runneth into it, and he is saved. You are safe and secured in the refuge of the Lord in Jesus' name. There is none like him. There's no, there's no one as powerful as him, as mighty as him, as exalted as him, as a wonder-walking God like him, no other one like him. In verse 27, the eternal God is a refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. The Lord will be with you. In verse 28, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. And also his heaven shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help. And then it says, and who is the sword of thy excellency? Thine enemy shall be found liars unto thee. And thou shalt tread upon their high places. When you remove your heart away from the gods of this world, and you say, there will be no idol, and there will be no image that I'm going to be touching or bound down or trusting. I'm going to trust only in the Lord. You're not even going to trust in their oil. Some people carry bottles of oil about. That's another God for them. You're not going to trust in their water. Some people carry some bottles of water about. That is their God. You're not going to trust in their candle. Some people trust in candles. They do not trust in the light of the word of God. Our God is enough to trust. And we trust our God. And we're not going to trust any idol, any oil, any water, any candle, any name of any angel. Our God is in heaven. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we're going to trust him and trust him alone. And he is able to deliver. He will deliver us in Jesus' name. As you look at Second Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 22. Second Samuel chapter 7. We're reading from verse 22. Again, it's still reminding us that there's no comparison to our God. Our God is so great. Our God is so high. Our God is so mighty. Our God is so powerful. There is no comparison at all with this great God of heaven. Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 22. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee. Always remember that. Every believer in the Bible. Have you seen that from Exodus to Deuteronomy to Second Samuel to other parts of the Bible? Everybody chorusing it out in unity. There is no God like our God. If they are singing and shouting it, you also ought to believe it that there is no God like our God. I said no God like our God. It says in verse 22, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for, to do for you great things and terrible. For thy hand before thy people, which thou hast redeemed to thee from Egypt and from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed to thyself Thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant. David is saying, God, I know you're a faithful God. I know you're a truthful God. I know you're a covenant keeping God. I know you're a mighty God. I know you're a powerful God. I know there's no other God like you. We have heard with our ears, we have seen with our with her eyes, and were felt each in her bosom, within her heart, how great, how mighty you are. And now, God, I hear the promise you have given me. And you have spoken some great, wonderful things concerning me. Do as thou hast said. That's how to pray. In verse 25, and now, O Lord God, 
the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house to establish it forever and do as thou hast said. Can we say that together? Do as thou hast said. Can you say that again? The idol worship class cannot say that to the idols because those idols, they have eyes they cannot see. They have ears they cannot hear. They have mouth they cannot talk. And they have hands that they cannot handle. But our God who created the whole heaven and the whole earth is a mighty God. With him all things are possible. Is a great God of glory and of power and of majesty. Nothing shall be impossible unto him. Therefore, we can easily tell him, O oh Lord, you have given me a great promise, a mighty promise, a wonderful promise. O oh Lord, do as thou hast said, he will not disappoint you. In First Kings chapter 8, verse 23. First Kings chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 23. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee. Do you see the experience of all these men of God? All through the Bible, from the very beginning to the end, every one of them confess and trust in the Lord and in having the promises of God being yes and amen in their lives, they all confess, O oh God, we have heard, we have seen, we have known, and you have done great and wonderful things in our lives, and this is our confession. There is no God like you. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above, on earth beneath, who keep covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. First Chronicles chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 19. First Chronicles chapter 17. Reading from verse 19 and verse 20. Still the same thing. I'm just showing you that all over the Bible, everybody knew. Even Nebuchadnezzar eventually knew there is no God like this God. You don't want Nebuchadnezzar to have more knowledge than you. That idol worshiper, blinded by the God of this world, eventually came to the recognition and the revelation of who God is. You don't want that person, Nebuchadnezzar, to know more than you know. If Nebuchadnezzar realized there's no God like this God, you better realize there's no God like this God. I said there's no God like this God. In might, in power, in holiness, in goodness, in his providence, in his redemption, and in his uh, forgiveness, in his salvation, it is a uh, majesty in his glory. There is no God like this God. Like they believed it, you ought to believe it, you ought to know it, you. And when you get in trouble, when you have any problem, when you have any mountain, when you have any affliction, and when things confront you beyond your power, beyond your strength, you will be able to also say, I know my God will deliver. I know my God will help. I know my God will sustain. I know my God will support me because there is no other God like this God that is great and mighty. It's First Chronicles chapter 17 verse 19. O Lord, for thy servant's sake and according to thine own heart hast thou done all this greatness in making known all these great things. O Lord, there is none like thee. That's it again. That's it again. O Lord, there is none like thee. Neither is there any God beside thee. According to all that we have heard with our ears. You are hearing the same thing. And that same power will work mightily in your life in Jesus name. Psalm 113. I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 113. Psalm 113, reading from verse 4. The Lord is high above all nations, and His glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth Himself to behold the things that are in the, in the heaven and in the earth. Then it says in verse 7, He raises up the poor out of the doors. He will raise you up. And lifteth the needy out of the dunk hill, that he may set him with the princes, even with the princes of the people. That promise will be yes and amen in your life. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 40. It's telling us he has no comparison. It's telling us he has no rival. This God is a mighty God. And this God, he will be with you. 
Isaiah chapter 40. I see how God revealed himself unto the people. And he told them and reminded them, The idols of the land may be there, but they are wood or stone or silver or gold. But the God of heaven has no beginning, has no end. And his power has no comparison. Isaiah chapter 40, I'm reading from verse 18. To whom then were ye liking God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? He's still reminding us of the very fact that God is so great, so mighty, and so powerful. And God is in heaven. He's so high, he's so majestic. There's no comparison with him. That's why he said, to whom then will ye liken God? Or what, what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that, are, that is so impoverished, so poor, that he has no oblation, chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye, have ye not known? Have ye not heard? As, as, uh, as it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sits upon the cycle of the earth. That Jesus is talking about God now. He sits upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretch out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. It's not talking about the greatness of God, about the might of God. God is so great that the princes of this world, they're like nothing. The people of this world, they're like grasshopper in his sight. He tells us in verse, in verse 24, Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And a wild wind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then were ye liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Is challenging us and telling us, reminding us that he is the incomparable God. No parallel, no equal, no rival. And then he tells us in verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who has created these things that bringeth out their host by number. And he calleth them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jesus? Jacob, why speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, everlasting God, what kind of God? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faith. He will give you power. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that do what? That's our strength. That is our strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They shall not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. That's talking about you. As you wait upon the Lord, it will empower you. It will energize you. Embolden you and strengthen you for the race before you in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 43, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're reading from verse 11. It's still telling us that our God has no comparison. I, even I, I am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and I've saved. I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Listen to verse 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he. 
and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Listen to this. I will work and who shall let it. When God begins to work in your life, nobody will be able to hinder in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6. It tells us here, it says, For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee the seat appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. This God is a special God. It's a great God. It's a unique God. It's an exalted almighty God. Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, verse 32, still reminding us how great this God is. Still reminding us how mighty this God is. Still reminding us how incomparable to anyone, anything, this a great mighty God is. Mark chapter 12, verse 32. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there, is, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. We are, we are convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that this God, the God of heaven, the God of power, the God of glory, the God that is mighty, highly exalted, there is none like him. We come to point number three now. The infinite greatness of the most high. The infinite greatness. His greatness is immeasurable. Uncalculable. You cannot calculate or measure it or weigh it. Because it's so great and it is infinite. Here is what eventually Nebuchadnezzar discovered. He now knew that this God is such a great God the greatness is infinite. In Daniel chapter 3, I'm reading verse 26. Daniel chapter 3. We're looking at verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furry furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of what kind of God? Tell me out loud. Most high God, if you were there that day, you'll say, Nebuchadnezzar, you have swallowed your saliva. You have eaten your words. Well, you know the one that was saying, who is that God? Now you realize who that God is. Your enemies will realize who God is. The detractors will recognize who God is. Your persecutors, they will realize who this mighty, great God, who he is in Jesus' name. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth, came forth out of the midst of the fire. And now in verse 29, in verse 29, therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which shall speak, which, which speak any sin amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a donk hill, because, because, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Daniel knew that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that. I know that you know it too. That there's no other God. Which God can heal like our God? Which God can deliver like our God? Which God can work signs and wonders like our God? Which God can perform miracles like our God? Which other God can create the whole earth like our God? Which God can divide the Red Sea like our God? Which God can make millions of people to pass over through the river Jordan like our God? Which God can demolish and destroy the Jericho walls like our God? Which God can open the eyes of the blind like our God? Which God can make the 
the lame to walk like a God, which God can make a person or three people go through the fire and they're not burnt at all like a God, which God can make you overcome all your troubles and challenges and difficulties like a God. We want to emphasize once again, there is no God like our God. I said there's no God like our God. This God is mighty. It's a miracle worker. This God is the redeemer. It's the deliverer. This God is so mighty. Whatever problem you have, whatever challenges you have, this God will deliver you. If you're sick, this God will heal you. If you're oppressed, this God will deliver you. If you have affliction, this God will set you free. If you're in any bondage, this God will, will make all the bondage, all the shackles will be totally broken out of your life in Jesus' name. If you have a mountain, this God will remove that mountain. Because there is no God. There is no God that can deliver, that can solve our problems like this God of heaven. Now, isn't it wonderful? This is coming out of the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar. No God, there is no other God that can deliver. After this God, look at chapter 4 of Daniel, chapter 4 verse 2. It says, I thought it good to show the signs and the wonders that the high God uh, is calling him again the high God. It's not the low God. It's not the earthly God. It's not the mundane God. It's not the idol God. It's the high God. The majestic and the exalted God. The high God has wrought toward me. In verse 3, how great I signs. How mighty I his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. Chapter 4 verse 34. In verse 34, and at the end of the day, I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And, I, and I, I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, and whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32, telling us how great and mighty our God is. And telling us there's no comparison, there's no rival with this mighty God. Jeremiah chapter 32, I'm reading verse 17. Our Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretch out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. As you think about your life. As you think about the challenges you are facing today, as you think about your family, as you think about the needs in your life, you can say, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and by thy stretch out arm, and there is nothing, nothing, nothing too hard for thee. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? No, nothing too hard for him. Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 24. You'll see the greatness of God, the majesty of God, the power of the almighty God. Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 24. O Lord God... Thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works or and according to thy might. No comparison. Just to remind us again in uh, Psalm 47. Psalm 47 we're looking at verse 2. Psalm 47 reading from verse 2. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. There's no place you are in any corner of the world where the Lord cannot see you. Where the Lord cannot help you. Where the Lord cannot get you out of that trouble. Because we're told the Lord is the Most High. He's so terrible and so great and so wonderful. He's a great king over all the earth. In Psalm 92, I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 92, we're looking at verse 8. 92 verse 8. For thou, Lord, art most high. How long? forevermore. He is most high. He was the most high at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. 
It was the most high at, at the time of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when Nebuchadnezzar had gone, and then Belshazzar came, the Lord was still the most high. And when Belshazzar went, and then Darius came, and the time of Daniel came to throw him into the lion's den, God, the God of heaven, the King of heaven, he was still the most high. And now at your own time, in your own place, with all the difficulties and the challenges you have, your God is still the most high. And he'll see you through every challenge, every difficulty in your life. In Jesus' name, thou Lord art the most high forevermore. We're looking at Job chapter 36. Job 36. We're looking at verse 26. Job 36. We're looking at it from, why don't you read from verse, uh, read from verse 22. Behold, God exalted by his power, who teaches like him, who has, who has enjoined him like uh, his way, or who can say, thou hast wrought iniquity. Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold, every man may, that every man may see it, man may behold it afar off. Now verse 26, behold, God is great. God is great. And we know him not. We don't know how great he is. You know, when we have a little problem, we panic, we fear, because we do not know how great our God is. But here we're told, behold, God is great. And we know him not. Neither can we number of, can, can the number of his years be searched out. Psalm 135, Psalm 135. We're reading from verses 5 and 6. Psalm 135, verses 5 and 6. For I know that the Lord is great. Do you know it now? Looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego coming out of the fire. Do you know that God is great? Looking at Daniel coming out of the lion's den. Do you know that your God is great? Seeing the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, opening the eyes of the blind and making the limb to walk and raising the dead. Do you know that your God is great? Whenever you have a problem, whenever you come into a tight corner, and whenever the devil is trying to threaten you and trying to say, where will you go? Because now I caught you. Always remember, your God will show up on that, at that time. And you will recognize how great your God is. For I know that the Lord is great. And that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased that he did in heaven and in earth and in the sea and all deep places. Psalm 145, we're looking at verse 3. In Psalm 145, we're looking at verse 3. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is, is what? Unsearchable. It's so great, you cannot fathom it, you cannot know it, to the extreme end of it. You see how Nebuchadnezzar shouted, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. He recognized God as the Most High God. And then he said in chapter 4, I thought it good to show him. The signs and the wonders that the Most High God has wrought. And I bless the Most High. Nebuchadnezzar eventually recognized the God of heaven as the Most High. He, want, he at once acknowledged the true God to be the Most High above all. Can any mighty monarch, any mortal man claim greatness in the presence of the Almighty God, the Most High God, the Creator and the Possessor of heaven and earth? In fact, he tells us all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing all nations well their kings and princes are reputed as nothing the greatness of men in comparison with this almighty god is less than nothing in his sight the greatness of our god is not restricted to any location or restricted limited to any period of time number one is great in power Number two is lofty in dominion. Number three is eminent in wisdom. Number four is, uh, is elevated in glory. Number five is universal in authority. Number six is incomparable. 
unparable in sovereignty. Our God is no local deity, no, no, no petty ruler of a tribe. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. And he rules in infinite majesty with glorious and absolute power. God is the most high God. From everlasting to everlasting. We read it already in Psalm 92 verse 8. Thou Lord art the most high forevermore. What Nebuchadnezzar just discovered. The greatness and the supremacy of God. Which he had just known. Had been the firm and the thorough conviction. Of God's people since the beginning of the world. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 86. Verses 8 and 10. Among the gods there is none like unto thee. O Lord neither are there any works like unto thy works. Thou for thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art great. God alone. The psalmist said in Psalm 95 verse 3, For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In Psalm 96 verses 4 and 5, it says, For for the Lord, for, for the Lord is a great, is great, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Psalm 135 verse 5, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. On 145 verse 3, it says, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. You need to feel it. You need to know it. You need to sense it. You need to understand that, that whatever problem you have, whatever mountain you have, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. God rules over all and is to be to be worshipped by all because he's exalted above all and over all the universe. He is, the, is supreme over all people, over all nations, over all things. The God of heaven, the ruler of the universe, who occupies the throne of glory, having all others beneath him and having an everlasting dominion, he must be worshipped as the only true God and the living God where we're worshiping. In First Chronicles chapter 16, First Chronicles chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 25, First Chronicles chapter 16, looking at it from verse 25. Yeah, it tells us very clearly, for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of of holiness. We have seen today that God eventually conquered the will of Nebuchadnezzar. Crushed the mind, the will of Nebuchadnezzar. And all the people that are resisting God, that's how God eventually will crush their will. But we are not resisting God. We are submitting to God because He is our Father. He is our Creator. He is our Redeemer. And then He is the solver of all our problems. Our enemies shall be ashamed, but we will stand and we're going to enjoy the promises of the Lord in Jesus' name. Everywhere we go and every challenge we have, we're going to discover the greatness of our God and the incomparability of our God. You can taste that part tonight. I said you can taste that part tonight. You stand up and glorify the name of the Lord and worship this great and majestic God. Is great in power. Is great in majesty. And we know that there is no God like him. The gods of this world are impotent. Throw them away. Don't worship the gods of this world. They have nothing to offer you. But you want to worship the almighty God. And you want to put your strength. You want to put your confidence. You want to put your faith in the almighty God. And say, God, you are my God. Almighty God, you are my God. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he is my God. He is my redeemer. He is the one who has saved us. He is the one we trust in. Put your trust and put your confidence in the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, I reject all idol. I reject all idol. 
I reject all the gods of this world. I surrender myself. I give myself completely unto you. I bow down before you. I bend the knee before you. I surrender and submit before you. I consecrate myself unto you. I have implicit faith, unshakable faith, unwavering faith in this mighty God of heaven. There's no God like our God. The creator of the heavens and the earth. There's no God like our God. A majestic God. A wonderful God. Terrible to the enemy. Wonderful to his children. A covenant keeping God. Never tired. Never weary. He's never fainting. He's able to protect. He's able to defend his own. Those who are worshipping idols. The idols cannot defend them at the hour of trial. At the hour of difficulty. Those mighty men that carry Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And threw them into the fire. They were the people that were born. They were born to ashes. They died before their time. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The servants of the children of the Most High God. They were walking in the heat of the fire. And the form of the fourth man, of the fourth person, the Son of God, was with them. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, will not be drowned. And through the fire, through the flame, it will not burn you. When you trust in that God, when you believe in that God, when you have confidence and trust and faith in that God, a wavering faith in this God of heaven, is able to quench the violence of the fire. Able to neutralize the heat of the fire. And is able also to destroy and to silence all the liars. And so you can go through life rejoicing, happy, contented, having faith, having hope, resting in the Lord. Because he never disappoints those who have faith and confidence in him. Our God is great. Our God is mighty. There's no comparison with our God. There's no rival to our God. It's great. It's mighty. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Before the Red Sea, he'll divide the Red Sea before you. Is that mighty? Around the Jericho walls, he'll make the Jericho walls to fall before you. Is that mighty? In the lions then it will silence and shut up the mouth of the lions. He is that mighty and great and majestic. In the fire of Nebuchadnezzar. In the fire of the persecutor. It will not burn you. Our God is that mighty. Pharaoh will not be able to destroy you. Our God is that mighty. Nebuchadnezzar will not be able to terminate your life. Our God is that mighty. He'll provide for your need. He will heal your sickness. He will deliver you from attack. He will deliver you from oppression. He will strengthen your life. He will make you the man, the woman you are supposed to be. Our God is that mighty. No God like our God. There's no law like our Lord. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. And you can walk through life confidently, majestically. Because those who trust in Him will never be disappointed. What challenges are you facing? God is up to it. What difficulties are you facing? God is up to that. What load are you carrying? God is up to that. What oppression is confronting you? God is up to it. What sickness is raging like a storm in your body? God is up to it. A God will never fail. A God will never fail. Is a God of heaven. He is not restricted. Not localized. Like the gods of this world. Like the idols of this world. It's all the time for his people. It's there all the time for his children. He will sustain you. He will lift you up. He will bear you up in the sand. 
lets you dash your foot against a stone. It surrounds you. It protects you. To preserve your life. You can trust in him. You can lean upon him. You can rely upon him. With some wavering faith, some doubting mind, you can trust in the Lord. The incomparable God. No God like him. In the sea, in the ocean, in the sky, in the forest, in the village, in the city, on the street, anywhere. There is no God like him. He never fails, he never fails, he never fails. Trust him, believe in him, and find him to be true. Rest in his promises and find him to be true. He is a faithful God, he keeps his promises. Trust him, believe him, recognize him, accept the revelation that this God is great. Beyond any description, this God is mighty without any limitation. Have you not known? Have you not heard that this God, the everlasting God, is never weary, never tired, is never fainting? He giveth power to the to those who are fainting. And to those that have no might, increases strength. Trust him and believe in him. Hand over all your problems unto him. He cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Casting all your cares upon him. He cannot fail. He will not disappoint. He did not fail Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He did not disappoint Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He silenced Nebuchadnezzar. He will silence all your enemies. He will. Yes, he will. He will silence all your enemies. You can stand upon the unchanging, unfailing promises of God. He will not fail. He cannot fail. This is your moment of trusting the Lord. This is your moment of finding that a God has infinite greatness, immeasurable greatness. Nothing can withstand him and nothing can limit his power in your life. Haven't you heard? It's great in power. Loved in dominion, eminent in wisdom, elevated in glory, universal in his authority. Wherever you are, wherever you are, whatever challenges you are facing, whatever problems you are facing, he is up to each and he will see you through. Trust him, he cannot fail. Rest in him, he cannot fail. Believe him, he cannot fail. Even your enemies will confess. There is no God like this God. Bless him. Bless his holy name. Praise him. Praise his holy name. He's the most high God. The great God of heaven. The redeemer. The deliverer. The healer. The provider, the protector, the preserver of the saints. You're safe in his hands. Safe in his hand is a great refuge. The name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous runneth into it. And the righteous is saved. Trust him. That's how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted him. He did not disappoint them. 
He will not disappoint you. Always have the confidence in this God of heaven. Always have the assurance in this God of heaven. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And he will, and he will, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O Nebuchadnezzar. He will. Great God. Righteous God. Faithful God. A mighty God. An unfailing God. And he says, I will work. And who shall let it? Nobody can hinder God in your life. Trust Him absolutely. Trust Him implicitly. He will see you through. Lean on His promises. Stand on those promises. He cannot fail. He will not fail. He answers prayer. He does great and mighty things without number. The signs and wonders are innumerable. And it is yours today to claim. It is yours today to receive. It is yours today to possess. Trust Him. There's no disappointment to the people that trust in the Lord. 